give God praise for that. Amen. Well, it's exciting to be back in the pulpit. And, amen. Amen. And it's exciting to be able to bring the word to you here today. And uh, when I get into this, it's just funny how the Lord works because... Uh, there's just some things that it's got to be the Lord that's worked through this, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But today, I got a question for you as we start the sermon today, and that is this. Have you ever been to a place that you did not want to go? You've ever been to a place that you did not want to go? Someone dragged you into it? You were against it, but you went there anyway. You know, you got, you know, um, cajoled into it. I don't know if that's a word or not. But uh, there's a lot of times in life we end up places we don't want to be. I know for us, um, there is a trip we took um, to Chicago with some friends one time. And so we're in Chicago, and this was about 2004, I think. This is before smartphones and GPS and all of that. Now we did have the internet and we had like 20 pages of printed directions, okay? <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, which, you know, back in the day, that was, that was something too. That was, man, we were fancy, I thought. But, you know, the one thing about printed directions back in the day is they didn't, you know, take into uh, consideration of uh, road work and construction and traffic jams and all that sort of stuff. So we're going to Chicago, and, and we're in Chicago, and, and my buddy is driving, because it's his parents' car, and uh, we were driving, and he took some wrong exits, which of course he blamed on his wife, who was sitting in the, the next seat, of course. And, and you know, he, poor Sally's trying to do the best she can to go through all of these pages of like, where to go and all this, and my buddy was like, I'm just gonna keep driving, I'm just gonna keep driving. We're just going to keep driving. We're not going anywhere. We're just going to keep driving. We're going to be on this road. Well, somehow we ended up getting lost in Chicago, which is probably not the best place to always get lost in. And so we got lost. And uh, so we ended up somewhere on some road. And like, you know, there's there's uh, glass shattering. There's guys walking around with baseball bats. Uh, you know, all that nice stuff that you think of, you know, in Chicago. Uh, I was in the back seat trying to take pictures of it, but they were like, Phil, quit doing that! Don't bring any more attention to us than what you have to. But it's funny, you know, there are places and, you know, intersections in our lives that we can just get completely lost in and entangled in. And whether we wanted to end up there or not, we do. And let me just say it this way. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says to themselves confidently, I want to end up being depressed today. Yes, that's exactly what I want. But yet, sometimes we end up and we're that way. Nobody wants to go into loneliness or fear or isolation or even sickness. Hello, church. <laughs> no one wants to go into those things. But you know, sometimes we do. But my point is this. We end up in places we don't belong. But oftentimes, you know, through the help of the Lord, through His grace and love and all of the other things that God just blesses and pours out, you know, we can oftentimes, as believers, you know, get back on track with things. But, you see, there comes a point in life, in everybody's life, my life and your life, where that track does come to an end. And as we're going to see in the scriptures today, as Jesus is talking, there's one definite place that we need to avoid at all costs. So let's get into the text today. We're going to be in Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. And I want us to stand today for the reading of the word of the Lord. I know it's a few paragraphs, but I believe that we need to stand as we read the word of the Lord together today to honor the reverence of what God is going to be able to speak to us. So we're going to be in Luke chapter 16, verse 19 through 31. This is the story of the rich man and Lazarus. 
This is Jesus speaking, and he says this. He says, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. And at his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. How would you like that? That's kind of a rough life there. And it goes on to say this. It says, the time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham! And he didn't say with many sons, many sons have Father Abraham. <laughs> he didn't have time for that. He just said, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides, all of this between us and you, there's a great chasm that's been set in place. So that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. And he answered, Then I thank you, Father. Send Lazarus to my family. For I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will also not come to this place of torment. And Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, no, Father Abraham, he said. But, but if someone from the dead goes to them, then they'll repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even, someone say even, even, even if someone rises from the dead. Yeah. Let's bow our heads today for the receiving of this word. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, um, as we get into this word today, Father, uh, I don't know who this is for. I don't know um, what your plan is with this today, but I do know this. I do know that you are ready to come and work and to speak your word into our hearts, into our minds, and into our entire beings. And so, God, I know that this word is not going to go without being heard and felt and spoken to by someone. And so my prayer is today that for whoever that this word is for, I simply pray that, Lord, right now your Holy Spirit surround that person surround the situations within their life. Father, just be able to be an open channel so that way they can hear and, and feel you, Father. They can know that you are close and that you are near and that this is for them. And so, Father, I pray that this word um, be edifying, Lord, to us. Lord, help me to preach this in the way that you would want me to preach this. Use my mind, my thoughts, my, my tongue, Lord. It's just anointed all for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. You guys may be seated today. This is a fearful and often forgotten text. It's fearful because of its subject, which is known in the NIV version as Hades and other version as hell. This is also fearful because of who the speaker is of the text, which is Jesus Christ himself. Forgotten also because this text speaks of the seriousness of of how one chooses to live their life and the consequences of that choice. Few sermons today really have anything to do with talking about saving and helping people to avoid hell at all costs. I want to say this, it is a real place. It is not just a for fun thing that people have made up it is not something that we as Christians need to align ourselves with by any means. This is not a place that God ever intended anybody to be in. But yet, it is there, it is real, and Jesus himself spoke of it within this piece of text. 
So the sermon title today is this. Are you ready? I know it's in the bulletin. But it's called, Who Cares If a Sinner Goes to Hell? Now for you, that might sound a little rough coming from me. I don't know. But you know, we have to understand the seriousness of this subject because it is serious. And I want you to know that although some of you may be shocked by the title, I don't know if you are or not, but I want you to know, you know, as believers in Christ, if we honestly claim to be saved and sanctified and quite honestly the best Christian that Putnam County ever seen in its life, I got a few chuckles, but I don't yes. think people got that. But if you honestly claim Jesus as your Savior and you claim that you are a Christian, I want you to know that we need to come alongside people and help them to see the same Savior that met us when we were lost. Help them to see the same Savior that we met when we were in despair in isolation, and whatever our situation is. You know, I think one of the reasons why I think the world has such a problem with Christians or Christianity in general at times is often because we do not show any more empathy or compassion than really they do. I know, tough pill to swallow sometimes. But they wonder this person claims to have been changed and transformed by Jesus of Nazareth, who we know is in the transforming business, but yet they still walk and talk and do everything just like us. They cuss like us. They get mad like us. They don't care. They're selfish like us. But yet they'll wear, what would Jesus do? And that's just perplexing. You see, I want us to know today we need to care about people. You know, it's interesting. Me and Ross were talking. We hadn't gotten together on anything, but I know that he preached a sermon on who cares. So that's why I said today, I said this is interesting because I don't know who this is for, but it's interesting how the Lord is, I believe, speaking about the idea of caring. And so today I want us to know there are people within our lives. There's family, there's our loved ones, there's friends, there's co-workers, there's classmates, there's your neighbors, there's your acquaintances, and then there's the people that I know you don't really like, but you're going to have to love them anyway because Jesus said so. Okay? There's all kinds of people. But did you know that people are the only commodity which you can bring into the eternal presence of God Almighty into heaven? They're the only thing that you can take into the afterlife. You're not going to be able to take your fancy sports car or your money or your possessions. You're not going to be able to take your resources or your titles or your job positions. All, all of that's not going to matter in eternity. And this is why we need to care. Because people are the commodity which God also himself sees and values more than anything. Amen. So in fact, we know from the scriptures there are several supporting and caring characters that I want you to know about today that I know that can make a difference. I want you to know, number one, this. God the Father cares about you and he cares about the people that you're surrounded with. How do we know that? Because it says so in scripture. And I've used this one a lot, but it's going to be spoken again today. Who knows John 3, 16? For God. For God. <coughs> what did he do? So loved the world. Yeah. Yep. Amen. Now, some of you said it like you meant, and some of you said it like, oh, begrudgingly. Here we go again. But that's the word of the Lord. That is precious to us. That's precious to me because it was that scripture I know that helped me as a five-year-old to understand who God was and what he can do within my life. Now, as a five-year-old, if I could understand that, what more could that do for someone who's your age? I know it's the most read scripture, but there's a reason for that. 
Because God the Father cares. When God sent Jesus to a stable, that stable cried out that the Father cares. When God the Father sent his son to the cross on Calvary, that cross cried out that the Father cares. And even as today we wait for Christ to return, every day that we breathe, every day that we have life, and every day that we're given grace and love given by God the Father, it cries out that God the Father cares. Amen. He cares for the falling sparrow. <laughs> cares about birds and guess what he cares a whole lot more about you making sure that you don't fall into an eternal hell Jesus the son cares because what was Jesus's purpose this is what he said his purpose was he said his purpose was to seek and to save the lost that was his purpose in coming we see Jesus reaching out to sinners at every turn, at every point within his ministry. And he didn't care about what people talked about him. He didn't care about his reputation. He didn't care. Because he knew that he was doing what the will of the Father was. He was reaching out to people that were not popular, that were sick, that people didn't want to touch or be around. And he was reaching out. And you would think that someone like Jesus would want to be in close with all of the religious leaders of the day. But he didn't even care about them. What he cared about, he cared about people coming to know God in an intimate and personal way. He mingled with sinners that might, some of us here today even, like shock us. But he mingled with them. He was around them. And this is why his ministry grew, is because... They were able to finally see what the light was. They were able to see what it looked like, tasted like, what it was living in flesh and blood. Jesus, who is 100% God, but he is also 100% human. He was both. And here he was, being received by sinners into his ministry, who became transformed and changed by the power of God. Give him praise that he's still in that business today. He's still ready to do a change and transformation in you today. Oh, he's ready to do it right now in your seat. You don't even have to get out for it. You just got to say, I'm ready to receive that. Wow. It's powerful. That's the God that we serve. That's the God that we sing songs to. Our God is greater. Yeah. God, you're higher than any other. Yeah. Wow. Even on the cross, we know that Jesus, even at his worst, physically, mentally, emotionally, he was still. Because <laughs> there's some people like, well, I just don't feel like it today, or, you know, I just don't think I can do that, or this or that. Jesus on the cross who's exhausted in every single human way possible, still reaching out for one more to come into the kingdom of God. And he didn't care that that person was on a cross with him. But there is a thief. He's still reaching out, trying to enter in, having someone enter into the kingdom of God. And that same Jesus is also reaching out to every single one of you here today. He's reaching out to all of you out there online. He's reaching to anyone who would just care to listen to what he has to say and to receive that. Another character that also cares, of course, is the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit came down, of course, in Acts chapter 2, that was when we had Pentecost, and we know that. We've talked about that. And the Holy Spirit empowered believers to witness in its power. It takes the Holy Spirit to help us with that. Because when we are led by the Spirit, Things, things change, things happen. When we go on our own strength, on our own power, we sometimes get frustrated with God or with the church or ministry of blah, 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 this and that, because we were doing it on our own. And we wonder like, well, why, why didn't that work? Or why didn't this? But when we're led by the Spirit, the Spirit leads us into the things that it knows that we can be led into. And when we're led, we see what that's like. In Pentecost, 3,000 came to Christ in one day. That's amazing. 
Trust me, any preacher would be like, yes! Awesome! <laughs> but, here's what I want you to know, that the Holy Spirit is still working and moving today. He's working mightily. I mean, in all different spectrums and, 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 and streams of, of that. I, I mean, it's, it's exciting to see when people come to know Christ. It's exciting to see that even in the secular world, uh, if, if you're a music fan, there's a guy whose name is Sean Few. His album called Let Us Worship, it's number three, even on the charts, today, right now. And there's a powerful move of God. And it's because of the Holy Spirit leading and working in people's lives here today. Our sermon series has been called what? This month. What's it been called? The Harvest. The Harvest. Very good. I know, I was giving you a pop quiz and seeing if you were listening. And in talking about that, you know that the Holy Spirit's the Lord of the harvest, right? Okay, maybe, well, I'm, you're learning that now. You didn't see a lot of head shakes, so that's something new. The Holy Spirit's the Lord of the harvest. Why is that? It's because the Holy Spirit helps bring conviction to sinners. It helps reveal Christ to those who are repentant. It helps renew and it helps empower those who have a trust in Christ. And so we know this. We know that God the Father cares. We know that Jesus cares. We also know that the Holy Spirit cares. But there's some other characters that also care. Heaven itself cares. It cares because we know that in Luke 15, 10, which is just a chapter back, Jesus is speaking of having joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. Just one. Every time someone comes to know Jesus, heaven is exploding in the biggest party that you ever seen. Amen. As it should be. Every conversion also brings a new song of praise and worship. That's better than anything that's on Caleb right now. Because every time the angels make it up, I mean, you got to know that it's going to be blessed. <laughs> Y'all blessed. And heaven bursts with gladness every time we just say, okay, Lord, lead me to help lead others. Lead me to help lead other people into a personal relationship with you. Heaven cares. Now, this last one, I know it's going to be a little iffy, okay? And, and you're, you're probably going to give me some weird looks, so I'm going to try to explain it as best I can. Bear with me. But to, to a small extent, even hell itself cares because hell doesn't want you in hell, <laughs> okay? This place of torment, by its very nature, never invites people. <laughs> You're only brought there by your own willingness. So by its very nature, it knows its place. But by its very nature, it doesn't even want you there. Hell does not want your visitation. Hell knows that there is no way to get back to heaven once you make your stay in its realms. The chasm that is talked about within this piece of scripture was created by God for this place in its nature, and it's never, ever, 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 someone say ever, ever. it's yeah. never, ever going to have God's presence graced in its place. And it's not just God's presence, it's all the giftings of God. There's fire there. There's darkness and there's agony. Hell does not rejoice when people willingly choose their eternal destination there. It is the complete opposite of heaven. If we look at this text today, I'm going to work through this just real quickly. We look at the rich man. Who was this guy? We know that in some texts that there's an adjective called there was a certain rich man. And with that given, we know that this guy could have been a possible rich celebrity of the time. So it could have been a Kardashian of some sort. It could have been a, I don't know, a movie star. I don't know. I'm trying to break it down in today's stuff. But we know that it was someone who had a lot of wealth and material wealth. They dressed themselves up in purple as their favorite color. And they dressed themselves up in fine linens. Not that Hanes stuff. I'm talking about that stuff that you're going to be getting at that designer store. 
They're going to overcharge you for everything, but it doesn't matter because you got the money to pay for it. He lived in luxury. So he lived, you know, he was limo driving, high flying, you know, jet kiss stealing, like, you know, Ric Flair for wrestling or something. Woo! Woo! There you go. And, you know, at his gate was this guy named Lazarus. Now, what is interesting is, you know, the rich man he doesn't have a name? <laughs> He's just the rich guy. You know? They, here the beggar, which is interesting. He's actually got a name. His name was Lazarus. Now, this is not the same Lazarus that was probably found, that was resurrected by our Lord. This is a different guy. But this guy was covered, of course, with sores, long and eat what fell from his table, and the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when they both died. And the rich man had one thing that he couldn't buy. He couldn't buy his way out of hell. He couldn't buy his way out of hell. There wasn't enough possessions, fine linens, and purple t-shirts that he could have to get himself out of this place. But yet, what is interesting here is Lazarus, who was a beggar, who didn't have anything. At least, it's what the rich man thought. He thought he didn't have anything, but we know he did have something. He had, he had one thing. He had a relationship with the Lord. And it was that which gave him into the place of eternal paradise in heaven. But it says in Hades, in hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and he saw Abraham from far away and Lazarus by his side. So he called them, Father Abraham! Have pity on me. I, 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 I just need just a little bit of water. It's terrible in here. It's basically what he's saying. And then he says this. I am in agony. I am in agony in this fire. For those of you who think that hell is a place to party at and you're going to be like living it up, I hate to break it to you. But you're not. This man was in complete agony. It says in fire. It's his own words. Then Abraham replied, he said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things. Lazarus received bad things. But now he's comforted here and you are in an agony. And besides all this, between us and you is a great chest. It's been set in place so that those who want to go from here to there, you cannot cross over. It's funny. It's funny. What would? Not that I want to send anyone there, or not that I want you to go there. So you have to use your imagination, but I wonder for us, what would just five minutes in hell be like? Would it make us actually concerned like this guy for the souls of the people around us? Hmm? Let me ask you that. Do you care? Do you care? I believe Pastor Ross asked this question and, and preached this a couple of weeks ago. And yet here again, the Lord is speaking to us. Do you care? Do we care? We have a great opportunity today with our fall festival. We have a great opportunity to reach out to our community we have a lot of fun things, don't get me wrong. There is, there's some fun things. There's candy and there's games and there's all kinds of that stuff. Popcorn, who doesn't like popcorn? But one of the important things that I wanted to stress within what we're gonna try to do tonight isn't just to provide a little bit of entertainment, but we're gonna be trying to tell the gospel story it's going to be in a very short format because I know there's people and, you know, you kind of have to try to get them through. But my thing with all of it is this. Is we need your help. We need your help for tonight. And yes, we're going to have a lot of fun, but we need your help. Because I want us to be a church that cares about the community, cares about the souls 
of those around us, and we need your help. The church, again, it's people, not a building. And so tonight, I ask that you look within yourselves, and I know some of you are like, I just can't do some of that, I don't feel comfortable. But I want to point you to what Jesus was doing on the cross again. He didn't feel comfortable at all. But yet he's still trying to get one more in. Folks, tonight, as your pastor, I don't know where it's going to lead or what seeds are going to get planted, but man, if we can just get one more in, just one more. It'd be worth all of it. Heaven be shouting and rejoicing. New praise songs going on. And people could come to know Jesus. Do you care to spread his love and grace just by presenting yourselves to be present? You know, those who are caring often find ways to share the gospel. Those who, who care pray over people. Pray over their situations and try to be as best as they can intentional in developing relationships with people because we know that it's people that we should be investing ourselves in. Those who, who care want to bring sinners, it doesn't matter who they are or what they've done, into the presence of God. And it doesn't care about what their reputation looks like or what it may look like in that regard. My question is to you today, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So do you care? Do you care? Because church, it takes all of us. It takes all of us to care. This morning, uh, let's just stand. And um, I just want to have a prayer today over us. And then uh, before we do close today, I think we're going to announce the winners of the pumpkin contest. So don't just leave quite yet. And uh, also, I will need to talk to the board just very quickly about a couple of details. So if we could meet afterwards, um, I would appreciate that. But this morning as we're closing out today, I just want us just to bow our heads. And I just want you, where you're at, to, to pray this question. And saying, Lord, where can I care more within my life? Can we pray that this morning? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you because this is a, a very heavy, I believe, passage of scripture for some of us here today. It's heavy because we find ourselves wrapped within this story and understanding that this Hades and hell is not a place that you ever, never intentioned for humans to go into. You never intentioned for us to be there, but yet because we chose sin, there has to be a place where sin has to also be dealt with, where it's the end of the line. And Lord, it's just, it's tough because, Lord, I know many of us here, we never want to end up there. But it's also a place that is real. And it's only avoidable when we're able to give our hearts and lives to you and come into repentance, come into a, a sense of understanding that you want us in heaven with you. But we can't be there if we choose our own selfishness, our own ways, our own thinking, our own everything. So Lord, right now, we ask this question. Can you please show us, Lord, within our lives how we can care more for others, how we can care more about the things that will bring you glory within our lives? Father, help us to care. Help us to understand that there's people out there dying every day. And I'm not just talking a physical death. I'm talking a spiritual death that will send them to this terrible place of fire 
this terrible place of agony. It's a place that, Lord, you, you, you just don't want us to be there. But yet, we're sent there when we choose our own selves and our own ways above yours. Father, there are people within our lives that we need to be able to speak the gospel about to. There's people within our lives that we need to take the time for and be able to minister to. There's people within our lives, Lord, where there is a harvest of people, but yet are we willing to, to go? There's so much of that. And so, Lord, my prayer is just, will you help lead us and guide us? Father, this is what we need as a church. We need you to help lead and guide us. And Lord, as we go into the festival tonight, will you help lead and guide us as we minister to our community, as we talk about you and your story and your life, as we uh, show the love of Jesus by giving out candy and, and, and popcorn and all these other things. Father, will you just help us, Lord, to minister to those who come tonight in such a loving and graceful way so that even if it's just for one person, that a seed is planted to where in their life they can willingly choose you. Lord, all of this tonight is worth it. And we give you praise for that. Father, be with us as this next week we are led into revival. I'm excited, Lord, for what Mark's got, for what Princeton New Life has got, what Rick Lee James has got in store for us, because I believe that this is going to help renew and equip and restore and help us, Lord, to be engaging for your kingdom and for your purposes. And so, Father, we pray, Lord, today that you help us, Lord. We pray this in the name of Jesus. All of God's people said, Amen. 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 All right, you guys may be seated for just a moment. Well, I know that Pastor Phil would like for us to announce the winner of the pumpkin contest, but there's a three-way tie right now. So um, <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to leave the um, voting open a little bit longer. So um, if you guys um, pick a pumpkin that's your favorite, if you can vote, um, and then we will announce the winners next week. We'll have it open this afternoon, this evening, during the fall festival. Um, so make sure you vote for your favorite pumpkin, um, and then we'll um, announce the winners of the pumpkin contest next week. Is that okay? Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Amen. Well, um, may the Lord's peace and blessing be upon you today. Um, again, who's coming here today at 4 to 6? Okay. All right. You can come a little earlier if you would like. I'm sure that won't, won't hurt. So we'd love to see you here tonight. God bless all of you guys. You guys are dismissed today.